Welcome to the glorious return of Dan Does Data. After a hiatus of two and a half-ish years, I was very busy doing a lot of things, uh, but I wanted to kick off the channel again. I don't know how long I'll keep this going, uh, but I wanted to give it a try, put us there, see what we're going to do. Tonight, uh, we're not going to launch into a brand new Spankit project. That'll be next week. I have a couple ideas for what we might, might do, and I might look at those. I want to return to our classic roots of, oh, TensorFlow, look at you. Uh, Google recently released uh, version 2.1 of this library, and that's pretty interesting, I think. I'm actually going to kill my sound, because hearing myself talk uh, with noise-canceling headphones is extremely weird, so we're just not going to do that. All right, but yes, we're going to look at some of the tutorials here for TensorFlow 2.1.0. Some of the stuff we have certainly covered before, other people have many covered. Uh, I thought this would be a good way to get back into the, the situation. So we're at tensorflow.org over here. We don't need to install it. I already did that. That part, you know, that's still kind of a pain. Uh, there are Docker containers these days that can make that your life easier. I don't want to use those because I need to have an X server on whatever's running to make X and Docker work together is a huge pain in the butt. Any graphics in a Jupyter Notebook is not going to cut it. So we're going to suppose that we're going to learn TensorFlow. Maybe we're new to TensorFlow. We're not, but we're going to check it out. We'd like to learn more. That's what flow over here, sure. Uh, we'd like to see the tutorials. That's where we'd like to be. There's all these like beginner quick start things. There's these expert quick starts, customization things. Let's try the advanced quick start. I have, I'm sure, looked at this at one point or another. They give you these collab uh, things, which are sort of their special, I think they're special, yeah, they're special notebooks. If you look down at the bottom left there, you can see it's a special IPython notebook that they have for you. I think that's silly. Uh, I mean, I buy the notebooks are okay, uh, but they're like 90% of what I want, and they're 30% of what I don't want. It's a very difficult problem. But I'd rather be able to just do this stuff directly. Uh, so what they do here is give you a bunch of code you can copy and paste. We are going to, can I do this? Oh, I can, nice. Oh, no, no, I lost it. Uh, we, I was saying we were going to keep one of these things open be over here, but that's not going to happen. We'll just have to flashback. Ooh, don't know what that is. We're going to have to do our stuff on the fly a little bit. That's how we work. I always import TensorFlow as TF. You're going to see me do stuff over here on the right, and then stuff's going to appear here on the left. But you're going to see me do this. You know, this little window will pop open, and that will determine where I send that line of code. Uh, I want to send it to the left. That's that one. Boom, and then it shows up. Amazing. I love America. It's so good. Anyway, what are we actually doing over here? Uh, we're in Python 3 already, so I don't need to do all this nonsense. You know that this import was very, very quick. Oh, I, can, I don't need that. Oh, go away. This import was very quick because I already imported TensorFlow and it took way too long, so I didn't want to do that again. Uh, we need some layers from Keras. Dense, flatten, con 2D. Let's do that. Uh, so we're going to... You could just look at it. You could say, well, tf.caris.layers. Dot. What is it? Con 2D or whatever. You could do this, you know, the whole time, but we don't want to retype that stuff over and over and over and over and over again. So, we will say from tensorflow.caris.layers import dense con 2D. What was the other one that they had? Flatten. Oh, of course. If you're playing a little convolutional model. You're probably gonna have to flatten things to get some single output in the end. There's ways around that, depending on what you're doing, uh, but that's sort of the standard flow. And then we'll also import generic model. I don't know why we don't import sequential. I feel like that would be easier, but whatever. We'll, we'll follow along with what they're doing and we'll change it wherever we feel like. Import model. Uh, so these layers up above, these are gonna be the things we use to create the weights that go along with our model. They will in part determine the connections in the model, that how it does its computations. This bit on the bottom here, this is going to be the actual object that contains the model, with generic model with a capital M. Uh, that's about as generic as it gets. Uh, so let's run these lines, make sure we have these. I think there's also sequential, yeah, that's a simpler form of model, sort of a single set of inputs and a single set of outputs and you just add things one at a time uh, to that. And you never sort of go back and grab something from an earlier layer and send it down later. It isn't as generic, 
but it's a lot easier to use, I find. That's what I have generally used, but I do my fair share of model as well. Okay, what else are we doing here? Oh, we want to grab the MNIST data set. The MNIST data set, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a whole bunch of images of handwritten digits. Uh, that has been the standard for a long time uh, to try to see how good can you do to take a small image of, I think, 64 by 64, or 28 by 28, excuse me, uh, 28 pixels by 28 pixels, and try to see what kind of image am I looking at. And we'll look at some of these images in just a second here. If they don't do it here, and they don't, which is a crime, uh, we'll do it ourselves. Uh, thankfully, it, in a, after a fashion, comes with TensorFlow. Well, it comes with Keras, so now we're using Keras for all this stuff. Do, 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 do. Keras used to be a separate library on top of TensorFlow or other machine learning libraries. Now it's a like API that is also part of TensorFlow. So it's a way to use TensorFlow that makes your life a little bit easier. The common things are sort of easy things become easy. Hard things are doable. And if it gets too hard, just use TensorFlow proper. Uh, I've certainly done a fair bit of that. We're like, well, I'm doing something in Keras and it's really great. But then I need to do something complicated, so I have to drop down the proper TensorFlow. And they're more tightly integrated now, so it's a little bit easier. Uh, let's say from TensorFlow. Dot, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to do this nonsense. I don't. Oh, okay. There, I see. They do the right thing. They say that MNIST is going to equal tf MNIST, I believe. So good at this. Let's take a look at this MNIST object. What is this? It's just a module. What can you do with MNIST? You can load the data. That's the only thing you can do. What does the load data do? Take a look at that. Oh boy. No, I don't want to do that actually. Let's zoom this all in. Perfect. Uh, yes, path where a cache was stored locally. So you just give it a path of where you want to store things locally. It will go to the internet, download uh, this data set. It's not very big, uh, so it's not going to destroy your computer or anything. Uh, that definitely is a risk with some data sets. Uh, yes. And what they do is they say, you know what, I don't want to, I only want to sort of follow their guide. I don't want to entirely do it. We'll just load data, the default is fine. I just want to know what kind of thing do I get? What is this thing? It's a tuple object. How long is this thing? It is too long. Uh, because what it is is all the training data and then all the testing data. Now, yes, I could have just copied and pasted this, but I want to understand how is this data being loaded? Because this is Dan does data. This is not just Dan copies and pastes code, although there's a fair bit of that as well. So we understand that a little bit better now. So what if I said, OK, well, train and test. I'm not going to call it test. Test is a terrible variable name. Never name a variable name test, because inevitably there will be something else that's named test. And just don't do it. Now I do this. And I say, OK, now I got this train object. What is train? Well, train, now look at the type. It's also a tuple. How long is that? Train, OK. Now at this point, I just want to like look at train 0. What the heck is this thing? This looks like an umpire array to me. It is an umpire array, 60,000 long, 28 by 28. Beautiful. Because that is, in fact, actually, I'm going to leave that like that. My x train is then train 0. My x, no, my y train is going to be train 1. And these are just going to be a bunch of digits. Let's take a look. Yeah, an array of digits, 0 through 9. If I say, what's the max of this? You get, oh, I didn't import NumPy. Oh, what a crime. What a crime. Always, I should do that first. Import NumPy as NP. NumPy is so good. There's a library called uh, Kupy, though, that does all your NumPy operations on your GPU. And it tries to be like method for method uh, drop and replacement. I fiddled around with it. It doesn't quite have all the things that I want yet that NumPy does. It was sort of like when I was switching to Python 3 and I had to wait for NumPy to switch before I could really do that. Anyway, now we have NumPy. Boom. You see, the max is 9, of course, because the maximum digit is 9. And we're going to take a look at the min, and the min is 0. OK, great. And you can also do a histogram. Oh, ho! Get some interesting things there. This is the weirdest. Yeah, this is. Don't worry about these bins here. Yeah, the bin from 0 to 0 0.9, obviously all the zeros. 
right here. From 0.9 to 1.8, obviously all the ones. So this is a relatively balanced. There's actually a few more ones than uh, everything else. I never actually knew that about this data set. Hmm. What do you know? Ones and uh, sevens are common? That's real weird. I never knew that. All this time, but I've never actually looked that closely at the data set. All right. That's our training. Now our validation will be this stuff. Valid. Valid. I like, it's not wrong what they do here at all, but you do it all in this one line using some sort of pipe, not some sort of, this is how Python works. You can assign things in this fashion. Uh, and I understand they just want to get you going quickly, but I would much rather be a little more explicit about how I'm loading my data right here. So let's make sure I run that code. I often forget that. There we go. Cool. Now we have that stuff loaded in right there. And you look at your validation data. Okay, great, that's an array. And you got 10,000. Remember our training data, we got, oh, did I never run that? I did. I'm terrible. Oh no. I also often tend to uh, suspend my Python session because my tmux, which is this whole setup here, uh, I use control Z as the, what is, here we go. I use control Z as the prefix command to do things in tmux. And sometimes it doesn't quite pick up correctly. But that is the nature of the beast. Okay. We got a little bit of data. Let's see what they want to do here first. What is this nonsense? Add a channels dimension. Why would you do this to yourself? Why, why not just reshape? tf.newaxis to a numpy array? What, what is new axis going to get from me here? No doc string. Oh, thanks. Thanks. What, what is it? It's a none type. It's just a none? That's all you're really doing there? Is it literally none? tf.newaxis is none? It is. It is literally the object none. That seems quite silly. I'm not going to do that. Uh, the reason they do this, you'll note the xt.sheet. Uh, you got this 28 by 28. Uh, however, what we're going to end up doing is having 28 by 28 by one object left so that we can more mathematically in an easy way end up with something that's going to be like, I don't know, 14 by 14 by seven, or whatever it's going to be. Because we're going to compute a bunch of things uh, for each for these uh, features. Uh, you know what? Let's take a look at our data first. I think that's more important. Uh, let me go back to the top and import matplotlib.pyplot as blt. This is one of the reasons I don't use a notebook so that I can look at things very easily like this. And you're thinking, I can do that in in my notebook. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, but it's stuck in the notebook. I like to be able to keep my figures up and around and move them around. Sometimes I line them up in funny ways. It comes in handy more often than you think. All right, Whoa. Okay, let's do plot dot, <laughs> um, mate show, im show, yeah, image show, xd of zero. Let's look at the first image, so to speak. Do, 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 do. Okay, you know, that's probably a five, right? Something like that. That's what that looks like to me. Uh, let's change the color here. Kill that, kill that, please, thank you. No, you're still open? There you go, just takes a second. Uh, not the speedy, I actually had the same computer that I had two years ago, but I updated my graphics card, which is nice. And I have more RAM this time. Uh, so I should be able to handle more problems, but we'll see how it goes. So, I wanted to show you color map, cmap equals plot.cm.gray. Should be a little bit, yeah, there we go. So this is very white, and you can see in the lower right of this box, down here you'll see it. It gives you the actual value. So you're up to 250s, this is just a brightness value, and then you're gonna a whole bunch of zeros. So that's pretty cool. Good, okay, that's closing fast now. Uh, let me comment this out, just so we're not running that right now. All right, that was one of the input data points. Uh, you know, let's look at another one. Let's look at 10, just for giggles. That's clearly a three, right? Boom, boom, you got the shape, you know how it works. Uh, something you could do, that would be interesting, actually. Uh, let's look at an average of, let's look at an average of everything. Why not, right? We can do it. 
uh, numpy dot mean of mm, x of t. Hang on, can I take a mean over two axes? I think I don't think I can. I think I can take a mean over one axis. Arithmetic mean along the specified axis. Return the average of the random ones. Oh yeah, 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 I can do this. Numpy dot mean axis equals zero. So I want to take the mean across all the elements. So this is the average digit. I don't know, it still looks like a three to me, clearly. Uh, but it's relatively well centered because they've already done that for you. It's nice and oriented at this vertical dimension, again, because they've already taken care of that for you. Uh, it's very convenient. Uh, I just thought that would be fun. You can, of course, do even more fun things. And none of this is dealing with like really TensorFlow or neural networks yet. We're just poking at the data because that's fun. And that's how you learn what the heck your data is doing. And this new axis thing is weird. We're going to do reshape. We'll get to that later. Uh, yes. What we else we could do is we could get the late, all the positions that are like ones or threes or whatever. Threes, uh, which is I'm going to say y of t equals equals three. Oh, you know what? That's even. I don't even need to do that here. Y t equals equals three. So yt equals equals 3 is a full full on array here. A bunch of true falses. And it's the same same shape as everything else. And as the labels, I should say. 60,000 long. This is going to tell us which entries over which to take our mean. And so you see, that's an average 3. And you could imagine making a simple model by making an average 3, making an average 2, an average 1. You sort of take this mask, slap it against your whatever your actual validation image is and seeing how it does. And you know what? That would probably be better than random. That would probably be decent. Uh, that's an average three. Well, no. Let me delete that. Uh, let me take a look at an average, I don't know, nine. Just for giggles. See, some people down here, their nines are not so goodly shaped, not so well shaped. It's a little bit, some people go straight down. Some people like to have the angle in here. This part, reasonably well shaped. Just a little interesting thing. Uh, if you like other colors, I think like heat or hot. Yeah, that's that could just be more fun. Uh, another color scheme that I think is popular, Veridis. This might be the default. I don't remember anymore. I no longer remember what the default ones are. I think this can actually help for perceptive differences. You can see these differences a little bit better. Uh, I believe the gray might nominally be the same. Anyway. We need to reshape the data if we're going to put it into a like convolutional neural network, which I'm not going to explain what that is today because I've explained that in other uh, videos before. What we need to do, I will just say XTT, oh boy, XTT, because I'm a terrible person about my variable names, XT dot reshape, and let's see, it's going to be all the things, oh hang on, XT dot shape. Turn in. All right, now I see why they did what they did. Okay, now I understand the value of new axis. Is that really? Hang on. XT, XT dot shape, right? If I take XT of dot dot dot, comma none, dot shape. That is dark sorcery. I did not know you could just add a dimension like this. Well, we're doing that. Like, reshape is kind of nice, except when you want to reshape it, like you need to know the exact shape. So to do the same thing that we just did, uh, to do this, this, you have to do be over here on the right, and you have to grab the shape, turn it into a list because it's a tuple first, and then append a like one to it. And this would be the same thing, right? Take a look at that. That's the same thing. But that is actually a huge pain in the butt. So we are just going to do xt of uh, dot dot dot, comma none. That none is super handy. That's super cool. I did not know you could do that. Groovy. Change it for y, and we'll change our validations as well. xbb, of course, is what this will be. B, 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 B. Do this. Okay, so now we got our data set up in the right way. They were gonna make some goofy model. Oh, that downloads the data. We already downloaded it, we got it. Oh God, they make a terrible, they make a 
data set object. They put this in a class. There's all this nonsense. I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm not doing this right now. Tell you what, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a model right now. Boom, model equals model. Uh, come over here, model, I believe. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Functional API, what do we need to describe? Oh, they inherit from model. Jesus. Why would you do this to yourself? Why would you do this to yourself? That's ridiculous. Like, yes, when you're making a production level problem, maybe you start this way. I don't want to start that way, though. I just want to get going, making my model. This is also why I like sequential. So you have to carry that model. Inputs equals inputs. Okay, that's... Yes, that is what we want. That's actually what we make last, oddly enough. Sounds a little strange. Uh, we'll make our inputs. Equals tf dot dot input. Our shape, in this case, is going to be. Did we put in the batch size? Yes, no. They don't even think about it here. They call x. It looks like they somehow avoid that problem. Oh my god, they apply the gradient manually. Why? Why do this to yourself? There are times when you want to do that. Yes, this is not one of them. Even the advanced start, like that just doesn't make sense to me. The advanced start should assume you know what machine learning is. You know how to build, you know what MNIST is. Here's how you do this in TensorFlow. Okay, done. That's, I don't understand why that's important to them. I understand why they want to do this data set stuff because that's a cool thing you can do with TensorFlow that is cool, but is also a little complicated. And I have found not the most useful, but that's me. Anyway, inputs. They don't describe the shape here. So, fine. We'll look at it, tf.caris, nope, lowercase, tf.caris.input. How does this work? Used to instantiate a Keras tensor, yada, 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 input A, B, da, 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 A, B, and C, I don't know, that's not what I want. What are the inputs? Jesus, can't read it like that. Cannot read it like that. Not including the batch size. Okay, that's what I needed to know. Do not include the batch size. So 28, 28, 1. That's our input shape. Right. We'll grab our inputs. Perfect. Now what a lot of people do, even when they're using this model, this functional model like this, you can sort of have arbitrary graphs. Uh, yeah, yeah, sort of arbitrary graphs constructed. Maybe arbitrary directed graphs. Uh, directed acyclic graph, I should say, a DAG. Uh, you can just say x equals and then whatever. And then you'll just keep saying x equals whatever. And so you're still really using it sequentially, but you only have one variable to keep track of as opposed to a different variable for every layer of your model. Now, what are they actually doing here? They're using con 2D. OK. Con 2D. Yeah, there we go. Uh, they're saying, I want 32. I want to compute 32 different features, uh, 32 little kernels that we're going to compute with this object. And we're going to take a 3 by 3 convolution. I believe that's how that works. I could be lying. Let's find out if I'm lying. 2D convolutional layer. What the frick is this? This is a strange setup for what the Python looks like. Maybe it's just what my system is weird. Yes, the number of filters, and then the kernel size. Strides usually defaults to one, meaning we're going to move a little bit by a little bit. Padding, they say, is valid. I prefer padding equals same, because that's the only sane way to go. Uh, padding equals same. So I want to end up with the same size object that I started with. So we'll append zeros if you need to append zeros, whatever. Activation equals, they do rel I think. Rectified linear unit. Let's do this. Boom, X. Cool. Now we got a thing. Oh, but it needs to inherit from something else. Doesn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, like, this, hang on. This, this is going to seem weird. This part right here, this sort of creates the layer. This creates the object that will create the layer, but it does not create the layer itself. So I should not save this off. What I need is to call this. It's like making a little function on inputs. It sounds crazy. I haven't run inputs yet. There we go. And then it does all this TensorFlow stuff. 
That's it. It's thinking real hard about it. I don't know why it's doing this here. There's no reason to do this. Uh, I haven't actually run this graph. There we go. Yeah, see, I got myself GTX 1060 6 gigabytes. Uh, for both machine learning and gaming purposes, it turns out. Uh, yeah, so that's X. Make sure we're not using X anywhere else. We're not. So now, we're going to make another thing. And this is going to be some something that takes X in. Right, but we want another layer. What do they use here? They do a, a flatten. Flatten's a simple layer. It takes whatever your all your convolutional things, all your kernels, unrolls all those into like a one-dimensional array for each uh, data point. So that's simple. That's good. Now, let us... Do, 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 do. Now they do a big dense layer. Okay, cool. Dense, 128. And I need to say the activation, right? Yeah. So we want to compute 128 intermediate values uh, for each of those values using all of the inputs from the flatten. So this this gives you a lot of parameters. This is always what, what's going to kill you uh, in one of your parameter sets like this. And then activation equals whatever row you assign. And then we need one more dense layer. I want dense layer 10. Activation equals softmax, excuse me, softmax. This is our like output probabilities that we're actually going to compute. And so what we say with the model then is, model is we talk about inputs and outputs. Inputs and outputs. So you say inputs equals inputs. It sounds dumb because we only have one like input. It is kind of dumb. A sequential model would probably make more sense here. Outputs equals x. But again, if you had multiple types of inputs, if you were taking two images in, say, and trying to predict both numbers at the same time, for whatever reason, say you're doing that, uh, you could do that with this model. Inputs and outputs. Uh, something like that, I don't know, might be interesting. I will, I will say that's sort of a, along the lines of what I'm going to be looking at uh, next week. Okay, so that looks all hunky dory to me. What did I actually run here? What is X? Does X exist? X does exist. I ran this line. Let's run the rest of these lines. Oh, something didn't like me. Oh, right, because I didn't. I didn't actually run these because I'm not. Because I normally run a different method. So now it's like I don't want to run things on X again because X has gotten corrupted. So let me just come back here. Tensor object is no actually lower. What? Hang on. Let's go back here. This one's fine. That's fine. I'm sorry, flatten doesn't work? Oh, I know. Flatten, like this. I bet that's what it is. Let's remake these things. Yes. You have to do an empty flatten. There's nothing here. If we come look over here, yep, that's exactly what they do. Again, we're not following pound for pound. We want to develop it ourselves so we know what we're doing. If you just copy and paste, you know, you're not learning the same things. Learning what to copy and paste exactly is an important skill. Now you have an actual model. Yay, now you can do model.summary because you have Keras, because Keras is good. And you can see at the top, as nature intended, our inputs, tells you what kind of thing it is. There's none just says the batch size, can be whatever the batch size is gonna be. You've got, what the fnark? How did this get to be 32? That's, what just happened here? 32 was not supposed to be that. Well, that's fascinating. We're supposed to end up at 32 here, here. Yeah, yeah, 28, 28, 32. So somewhere our shapes got all mangled up. I uh, think so this is our channel and this is our, oh, do I still have like a dot theano? I bet I do still have a dot theano sitting around. Or a dot keras or whatever. Dot keras dot keras dot jason. Channels first, which is not how anyone works anymore. Everyone puts channels at the end, which is exactly what this thing does, doesn't it? That's what this is about. Oh, channels at the end. All right, let me fix that then. Channels last. Like I have this TF image dimension order here. You would think that would work. 
At least I like recognize that. This is why it's important to check what your model is doing. I'd be very upset if that's what my model was and I got the wrong thing. Uh, let me just kill this session because you would probably have to reload Terrus or Keras to actually uh, get back there. All right, now I'll come back up here, do all this. Cool. It's gonna take a little bit of time, load all that stuff. I don't need to do the plot that image show again. Do all this. Great. Let's do model summary again. Much better. Look at that. 28, 20, 32. Cool. Now we have a model that does something. Huzzah. How do we train it? Model.fit. Yeah, let's just do that actually. Model.fit. Trains a model for a fixed number of epics. Uh, normally you put in whatever your x values are, whatever your y values are, whatever your batch size is, all those other fun stuff. Uh, in fact, you can even save your history. I don't think you can change history this way, but. So XTT, YTT. Uh, I don't really care what the batch size is. Not in this not in this sense. What do they actually do here? Oh, you need a optimizer, that's right. I will copy this. No, I won't. I will you need an optimizer. What is the routine that you use to say, given that this was my loss in this direction, what do I want the correct uh how do I want to handle that? How do I want to update my model? Optimizers.sgd, is that a thing? Yeah, nice. Cool. Optimizers.sgd. 0.01. You know, that's our learning rate. How much we, uh, the fraction of the gradient that we choose to move toward. Right, now model.fit. How does this work again? We need the input data. I don't really need the batch size. I do need the epics. Do, 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 do. Validation is fine. Where is optimizer? Oh, I gotta compile a model. I'm an idiot. I need to say model dot compile. This sort of finalizes the graph. This is where you put in your optimizer, uh, where you define your loss function, those kinds of things. So we gotta do that before we, oh no, before we fit. So if I say model.compile and loss equals categorical cross entropy because we're doing a classification problem, optimizer equals SGD. Does this work? Can we get away with this? I can. Life is good. Now we have a model, it's compiled. So now we ought to be able to fit it. Uh, epics equals mm, 10,000, whatever. Let's just do one, just to make sure the model does something. That's always the most important thing. Is the model doing anything? This is doing a bunch of stuff. Where is, jeez, what the nonsense is this? Yeah, there's much easier ways to do this. Why would you, why would you do this to yourself? That's just so strange. I, again, I understand it's the advanced tutorial, but as far as like getting started quickly and understanding what you're doing. Also, this model has three million parameters. Wowzers. That's actually a lot for like a tiny little model. We don't have that. We only have 60,000 data points. So, you know, think about that. Way more parameters than we have data points. You can probably fit these parameters to do whatever you wanted, uh, given the inputs that we have. It's a bit dangerous, a bit dangerous. Uh, Model.fit. Validation data, that's right. Validation, it was model.fit. I have to look up exactly, like is there an underscore there? Okay. Validation data equals, probably want the inputs, xvv, yvv. I suspect that's what they want. And like, can you say metrics right here? Metric, lost any model metric. No, that's when we have to compile it. We have to attach a metric. You don't have to. Excuse me, but yeah, metrics, Doo -doo -doo -doo. metrics, and we'll say accuracy. There we go. That should work just fine. If it doesn't, that's dumb. Type of metrics argument. Like I don't understand why you can't just put it in a string. You used to be able to do this. I swear. Expected list or dictionary found accuracy. Well, fine. Oh, I see. I see. You want a one long list instead. There you go. 
one long list for you, TensorFlow. There we go. Recompile the model. Let's see the strings. Uh, you're passing a target array of shape, whatever, while using this loss category. Oh, right. That's a very good point. We need to turn our validation. Oh, what? You you can turn your validation into one dot encoding, and it is a bunch of one, zero, zero, zero for class zero, a zero, one, zero, zero, zero for class one, and so on and so forth. Or you can use sparse categorical content to be, which just means you don't have to bother. Well, that's handy. Uh, yes, let's do that instead. Let's call this sparse categorical cross entropy. So once again, I'll recompile the model. Now we'll try to fit. Holy moly. Look at all this TensorFlow. Be able to create Kublas. Great. You know, I tested things the other day. I did. I did test things the other day. Uh, but then uh, TensorFlow decides it doesn't want to do that. It wants to throw up in your face. Blast gem failed, launch failed. So let's do our debugging live, because that's what we do. That's not what I highlighted, thanks. There we go. Blast gem launch failed. Internal error. Yeah, TensorFlow issues. Yeah, not surprising that someone has reported this problem. And yet, if I do tf.test test that is GPU available it will report true which is interesting so it's a little lying a little bit so this person reported this two years ago yada 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 they're doing some grid search with tensorflow no other process is running the GPU I don't think I do I mean other than like Other than my graphics session itself, I don't think that should be a problem. I used to be able to do this. If this is a problem, we're going to run into problems. I'm not going to be happy camper. I might have to like plug back in my old graphics card uh, just to like run the graphics on my computer off that. And it, like, it's using all the freaking memory? Are you insane? What is wrong with this model? What is wrong? Oh, right. There's three million parameters, each one of which is probably four bytes, because they're probably using float 32s to store them. Uh, so, jeez, oh man, all these. Ugh. Ugh, forget it. Forget that. Three, two, one, three, zero, 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 two. Yeah, each one of which is times four bytes. So you're consuming that many bytes. That's only like 120, that's only like 12 megs. It's only not that much. Plus all the data itself, which is not a whole, whole lot. Right? No. And that's me, in fact, it's stored as uint8. Oh, which is, might also be causing some trouble. As far as the model is concerned. In fact, let's, let's fuss around with that a little bit. Let's take our inputs. Divided by 255. Let's do that. Is that? Mm, does that do what I want? Yeah, okay. Alright, that should be fine. Now, uh, those are fine. Let me see. Maybe it was just something it didn't like my data types. GPU mem copy failed. Figures. Yeah, well, that's amusing. We might not train a model at all tonight, but I will try to diagnose what that went wrong here. Yeah. Hopefully you didn't all just see my stream ID right there. Might have to update that. We'll see, not a big deal. That I can't check my own uh, GPU card, it betrays me. Okay, come back here, do this nonsense. Da, 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 da. Everything seems fine. Loaded libraries, all good to go here. YV, YV, V, 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 V. Do this. Do some stuff here. Let's, let's just retry this directly. Create TensorFlow device, yada, 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 yada. Everything's fine. Let's 
decimal numa known read from since it's had negative value, but there must be at least one number node so returning numa node zero. Okay, that's fine. I don't actually have that's just like a CPU related thing. Alright, well, let's see what happens here. Let's see if this destroys my machine. Blast gem fail, yeah. That's now let's go back here. Yeah, this person clearly has some other things. Ah, allow growth. That's what I think I need. I think I've seen this before. Jeez, oh man. In a config proto, it would have been one process for using yada yada yada. Okay. Uh, TensorFlow. GPU allow growth. Yes. How do I set this? It's one of those things that, like, I see it and then I don't remember exactly how it works. Print number of GPUs available, yada 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 yada. Growth. Limiting GPU memory growth. Yes. I want to consume no more than, like, I don't know. Absolutely all GPU memory, yada yada yada. Must be set. If GPUs, yes. So I really these to be the same across GPUs. Turn on memory growth by following set memory growth. TF tech effect experiment will not set. And I'll be only which GPU is needed for runtime application. So it's more. Blah blah blah. Turn on memory growth to the GPU. He's on. Like, what's this other method? TF force let. Okay, this one I've definitely seen. This configuration is platform specific. Yeah, it's also known as using a G single GPU on a multi now. Uh, da -da. Virtual device configuration limit, memory limit 1024. This is in megabytes, I assume? Let's configure a virtual GPU device. Let's take a look at this. TF config set logic. What? That's not what I clicked. Set virtual device configuration. I guess it got changed. Device logical devices. Okay, I want to set. I'm gonna go with no. Unusable. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. TF config. Jeez, oh man, what is this nonsense? I am gonna copy paste some of this because this is not stuff I've used before. We are running into the physical devices. TF is not. Oh right. Let's, let's do this. Let's do that. Do that bit right there. Yeah, let's do... No, 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 no. Come back here. Grab that. There we go. Okay. Okay. Physical devices. Name, physical device. GPU zero. Great. Then you try setting a configuration. So you try this stuff. What does this do? Let's take a look. What does something do? This is why I love IPython. What does it do? Set the logical device configuration for which you have a config to physical device. Specs pick your device, or list of devices, presumably. Da -da 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 -da. Physical, nope, the first device right here. Right here, I should say. Uh, put in a specific device, and then a logical device? Both have a single logical device associated with it. So you mapping your physical, your device, and your logical device. This is not the clearest thing, but so why do they take physical device zero, do this memory limit stuff, get some logical devices here? and say, I want there to be one more logical device than physical device. So we're like splitting up our GPU. Okay, sure. And then we take, we do this again, but we have a different memory limit. Why? That's, to me, is very strange. So we create two logical devices. So sort of for our machine to consider using, right? Then we can grab those logical devices. That's what it says. Right, now we should have two logical devices. Logical devices, yep. So we pretend like we have two GPUs, even though we really only have one. 
because physically there is one GPU. Uh, but what? This thing, tf.config, like it has a memory limit object. Memory limit, is this a percent? This class parameter is configured, and then all fields are valid for all device types. For usage examples, memory limit. Maximum memory in megabytes to allocate the to virtual device. Okay, well that's wrong. Uh, okay. So what I think we want to do is we do want to create a virtual device. That is correct. That is very much what we want. Let's come up here. Make virtual device. We have 15 minutes left. See if we can get a model going, doing something. Uh, yes. We need our physical devices. So this gives us our list of physical devices. That's good. And then we configure. Okay, what is going on here? I only want one physical device. I just don't want to use up all my memory. Is what I. That's what I want to avoid, actually. But how much? You are allowed to grab forty ninety six megabytes of memory. That is what the deal is. So logical devices equals then. Just give me all these guys. Like this. So, we will grab our physical devices. We will manufacture so a logical device that only goes up to four gigs of memory, so I don't kill myself. Cannot be modified after being initialized. Let's destroy them then. Because uh, I am king here. Let's do all this again. There we go. Should be all right. Perfect. Now, we create that actual logical device. Now I have logical devices. I should have one of them. And it should have, whatever, uh, four gigs of memory. How do I declare that I only want to use this device then? Da -da 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 splits the CPU into two logical devices. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I'll tell you what, this is, this is okay documentation. That's not not exactly what I wanted. It doesn't map with well with this. I could have sworn, however, like I'm gonna get burned because I didn't tell. Nowhere did I tell TensorFlow only use this GPU. Configuration is more specific, but then you don't say what to do. Which is irritating. Let's see what happens. And if it blows up in her face, it blows up in her face, and it is what it is. I'm not too concerned about it. If TensorFlow no longer works with like the GPU that I have in my system, I'd be very irritated though. Yes, and I think I only tested, could I import TensorFlow? Not how much am I really going to use it. Alright, you know what, actually, how about this? I don't want to do these things right now. We are going to build a much simpler model, and I want to see if that still destroys my universe. Uh, da -da. we'll still do this here. Hang on. So we need that flatten. Gots to have that flatten. Simple model. X is not defined. That is a bit of a lie. Screw it, we'll call it X. Everything's called X now. X, no, I need it. Ah, shoot. That needs to be inputs. X equals inputs. Right there. X. That's what I need. Do that. Perfect. This SGD. Let's see if we can compile a thing. And I compiled. We might have to go back to the beginner model and see what the heck went wrong. No, hmm. No, we've got some some CUDA errors. Blast is the basic linear algebra system. Gem launch failed. Yeah, that's different. That is not an error I've ever encountered before, of course. Had the same problem with this stuff. Uh, just a pickle of Keras model. Da, 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 da. People still having this problem. I mean, can we scroll up and see anything more useful? <clears throat> I doubt it. TensorFlow doesn't have the most useful uh, debugging output. I mean, there's just a lot going on. I don't. 
Don't hold that against the guys. Looks like we did one batch here. That was 32 long. And it uh, destroys. We tried to do one a single multiplication. It got destroyed. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, now we're, you were using all that memory. Not all everything, so that at least worked. That's a start. Yeah, this is pretty similar. Da, 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 da. Try shut down reading the notebooks. If you restart the kernel, yeah, this time it should work. Yeah, it did. Da, 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 da. Killed S9 to kill the process. Consume all available cheese. The Kennedy run other program is also active. That's insane. Like, there's no reason. Like, I can run Kudo without a program that's active. Removing end jobs equals negative one. Da, 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 da. Not doing that exact thing, though. The GPU memory is definitely enough. Because now the model is very simple. You said model.summary. Got this. You know, much smaller model now. Much, much, much easier to train. And people very recently having this problem. Shut down all running notebooks with user GPU. See, but like, I need to broadcast as well. I'm not gonna install all 10 GPUs in my machine just to do this. There's got to be another solution here. Flow. I mean, that's maybe a specific problem. So, I'm going to try to debug this for the next 10 minutes. And if that doesn't work, I will be debugging in between this week and next week. Uh, what the problem that I want to solve next week is, is I want to take a look at one of my data points. This isn't a specific data point. This is the average of a whole bunch. Uh, and then... Combine that with another data point. So we come back here. I don't know, I'll say I'm gonna look at the twos or whatever. Who knows? Doesn't really matter. Take a look at our these things. I want to lay one image on top of the other. When I say on top of, I want to average the two images. And then I want to be able to compute that I had both a two and a nine uh, for that. So I'll take random pairs of all the MNIST data points, generate the output, and say, I want to be able to predict that this is a both a 2 and a 9, that I've got both of those things. Uh, not like 50% probability this, 50% probability that. No, 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 no. I want the actual number out here, the actual number out here. I don't know how easy this would be, necessarily, because uh, if you do plot that image show of, I don't know, xt0, say, so yeah, that's a five, sure, great, life is good. Uh, and actually, is the cmap equal plot dot cm dot veritas? Veritas? Yeah, it is. Okay, I don't even think about that. Then. Anyway, if you did this, do, 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 do. take a look. We got a five and a zero. What if you combined them? plus this, right, so I average them out, and you looked at this. Could you determine that this is a five and a zero together? Or does it just look like hot garbage? It's gonna be a hard problem. I don't know how solvable it's gonna be. Uh, but I want things like that. This is a sweet logo, actually. I should save this. This is cool. Yeah, double image, I like that. Uh, yeah, that is pretty cool. Uh, can you rip out and then say, well, this is a 5 and this is a 0? As a human being, like, this is kind of hard. Like, I could see a 9 here and a 0 here. Yeah, there's this thing here. Is that part of a 7 or a 5 or a 6? This is going to be hard. <laughs> this is going to be real hard. Uh, I have a feeling. But, you know, we'll see how well it works. Uh, this might lead into another model where we take this as input and we try to spit out the actual images of the 5 and the 0 underneath. Again, that's going to be pretty tough. Uh, another thing we're going to have to deal with is I'm predicting two numbers. I don't really care what the order of those numbers are. I might try to predict the small one than the large one. 
It just might be how I order it. Just to have some inherent order for what it is that I'm computing. All right, what is this? This nonsense of this blast gem problem. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, here we go. I should see if this works. Let me do, 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 kill this. Come back. Uh, yeah, let me try to run this guy's code. Where he just does this eager execution. It's super cool. You can just run TensorFlow right away in whatever you create. It doesn't wait to make the graph. It's kind of cool. This is also destroying my machine. Ultra TensorFlow has no attribute. E enable eager execution. Really? That's fun. I could have sworn that it did. What version is this guy on? TensorFlow 1.2. 1.12. TF 2.1, eager execution. Can you do that? Is this default? Eager execution, eager execution. Executing eagerly. Oh, is it by default? Oh, okay. Well, I didn't think about that then. Great. Uh, in that case, I wanted this guy's okay, code. Dang it. Here we go. Just this. Just run this. Does this also destroy my universe? It does. Okay. That's good. That at least gives me some understanding that this is just totally hosed. Is there like a simple arithmetic test here? Benchmark. It's built with GPU support. I did do that, right? Yeah, okay. I'm surprised there's not like simple benchmark here. Test case. No, that's it. What about this? What does this do? Abstract class. Yeah, that's my thumb. Do, 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 do. Kill all running notebooks and restart the kernel to execute the code again. Don't have any notebooks running. Even with CUDA physical devices equals one. Well, that's a problem. Probably should be zero. CUDA air GPU is running out of memory. No, it's not. That's definitely not the issue. is truly running out of memory. I assume you mean it's not. Same code, same, same everything, runs in this. Da, da, da. CUDA 9. Non-eager mode or PyTorch runs without any issue. That's interesting, so it might be an eager execution problem. So if we create a little session, tf.session. Really? I could have sworn it did. Actually, here's a silly question. TF dot version. What version do I actually have? 2.1. Okay, okay, okay. Good, good, good. Dancer flow version. No. Session. 2.1. Oh, compat that v1. That's it. Fine. Compat that v1 dot session. Session. There we go. Jeez, oh boy. If I say with sesh dot as default, do that. Now what about this multiplication problem that this fellow had? Oh boy, up here. Da -da 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 -da. This thing. <laughs> Core dump. Great. Let's go over here. Then. Let's try this again. One more time, and then we will call it for the night. I will say sesh. Oh, it didn't even save my stuff, did it? Oh, it did. That's impressive. Did that. Okay, great. With sesh dot as default. Do this. Nope, same problem. So it's not an eager execution versus other problem. Other eager mode fails the same error. Da, 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 da. Can I turn off eager execution? Maybe that's a solution. I I get to exist without eager execution. TensorFlow to turn off eager execution. There we go. How do I disable this? Because it's causing problems. Disable eager execution. All right. Well, hang on. Hey, that actually did something. I mean, that's not the correct thing. We need to eval this. 
Right, there we go. Oh, that causes it to work. Great. One more time. One more time. Import this as TF. TF dot disable your execution. We're disabling it, right? Yeah, okay. Make a little session because we're now without without a proper session with sesh dot is default old school style. I am going to say print tf dot random dot uniform uniform. No, not even. Yeah, well, yeah. Now I want to do some. I want that. I want that matrix in there, right? Yeah. I need to evaluate that matrix. Yeah, I need to see the output of it to verify that this is doing something correct. There we go. Okay, so that will be what we end up having to do here. So let me very, very quickly. I don't, I don't even want to do any of that nonsense. Ah, Slimux. Slimux REPL configure. So now we're going to this one. Yes, I realize I'm on opposite sides of things now. It is what it is, you know. We're over we're over by a minute or two here, but we'll try to cram this. Cram this in. Now that we've turned off eager execution. And maybe that's just the problem. We compiled. Let's see how this goes. Two root errors found. No, still try to do this. So I guess Keras overtakes that. All right, we did what we did. We tried. Uh, but TensorFlow is fighting against us tonight with esoteric errors. Uh, but things that it did not have a problem with before just does not surprise me. I'm gonna try to fix those. Next week we'll try to find, next week we'll start the new project. Uh, so that is all I got for tonight. Always remember, stay safe in the data mines.